examining for the face, we look for asymmetry and obvious abnormalities. This includes evaluating facial nerve function. Wrinkle your forehead for me. Close your eyes real tight. Wrinkle your nose. Smile. Tighten your neck. Good. The face is broken up into three horizontal components. From the hairline to the eyebrows, from below the eyebrows to just below the nose, and from below the nose to the chin. Relationships between these areas can affect the appearance of the face and relationships of the forehead, nose, and chin. Common abnormalities seen are squamous cell carcinomas and basal cell carcinomas. Obvious asymmetry or deformity of the nose or wrinkles of the forehead, around the eyes, or upper lip. The nose is divided into the bony and cartilaginous components. The bony component, known as the bony dorsum, is made up of the paired nasal bones, which are actually fairly narrow. The nasal process of the frontal bone and extensions of the maxillary bone on each side. The cartilaginous component, known as the cartilaginous dorsum, is the central area of the cartilaginous septum. At the inferior aspect of the nasal bone are the upper lateral cartilages, which are attached to this bone as well as to the nasal septum. Going inferiorly is the nasal tip, which is comprised of the lower lateral cartilages and the caudal end of the nasal septum, which give the shape and form to the tip. In looking at the nose from below, one sees the nasal ala and columella. The nasal ala and columella are made up of components of the lower lateral cartilage. Below the columella is the philtrum extending to the vermilion border. Common abnormalities of the bony and cartilaginous dorsum include deviation, bony humps, saddle deformity, which is related to loss of the nasal septum, and lack of tip support in the columella. In addition, the nostrils may be asymmetric. I'm going to look on the inside of your nose now. In examining the nose, one first encounters the nasal vestibule, which usually has a similar skin tone as the patient's. There are hairs in the vestibule, known as vibrissae. The vestibule, because it has hair follicles, may develop infections, as does the skin. The nose is divided into two cavities. The midline structure is known as the nasal septum. The mucosa is usually pink. The septum may be deviated to one side or the other, or both. The septum contains two components cartilaginous and bony. The cartilaginous component is known as the quadrilateral cartilage. The bony components include the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, which comes from the skull base, and the vomer, which extends up to the face of the sphenoid sinus. Inferiorly, along the floor of the nose, which runs parallel to the roof of the mouth, one might see the maxillary crest, into which the quadrilateral cartilage sits. Lateral to the lower nasal septum, are the inferior turbinates, which, when enlarged, may be mistaken for a nasal polyp. The turbinates tend to be pink in color. If it is erythematous, it tends to suggest inflammation. If it appears pale blue, allergy should be suspected. If you use an otoscope with a large nasal speculum, one can often get a better view of the posterior aspect of the nose. This includes the posterior aspect of the nasal septum, and the middle turbinate, which sits 30 degrees off the plane of the floor of the nose. The middle turbinate is more posterior and smaller in size than the inferior turbinate, and usually pink in color. If the inferior turbinates are very swollen and congested, one should spray a decongestant into the nose, which will allow better evaluation of the posterior aspect of the nose. 
Occasionally on examination, one may see nasal polyps emanating from the area of the middle turbinate. On the anterior septum, you often see vessels in the area known as Little's or Kieselblack's area. This is a common site for epistaxis. One may see crusting of the nasal septum, the nasal vestibule, or the anterior aspect of the inferior turbinates, which is suggestive of infection. In most circumstances, the nasal mucosa is moist with minimal discharge, which should be clear. Nasal endoscopy is often performed by the otolaryngologist using either a rigid or flexible scope and includes evaluation of both sides of the nose. Rick, now I'm going to check your nose and your throat with a special scope. Okay. And before I do that, I'm going to anesthetize your nose. Okay. We're going to do one technique on the right side, which is spraying the nose, and on the other side, we'll pack it with a little piece of cotton that has the anesthetic on it. Allow adequate time for the anesthetic to work before proceeding. With a calm and patient approach from the provider, most patients will tolerate the scope exam very well. Okay. I'm just going to pass this through your nose. Okay. Okay. If it pinches, let me know and I'll change the direction a bit. Okay. Okay. The scope is placed into the nasal vestibule and starting along the floor of the nose, one sees the entire length of the nasal septum and the inferior turbinate. Raising the scope 30 degrees allows visibility of the middle turbinate, the inferior turbinate, and the middle meatus. The middle meatus is the area of drainage of the maxillary and most of the ethmoid sinuses. Any purulent drainage is suggestive of infection. This is the most common site for nasal polyps. Nasal polyps, however, can be so large to be obstructing the entire nasal cavity. Allergic or infectious polyps tend to be pale in color. If they are red or firm, it may suggest a tumor. Occasionally, one may see the superior turbinate on nasal endoscopy. If you continue posteriorly along the floor of the nose, the opening of the eustachian tube is seen laterally. This area is known as the fossa of Rosenmuller. As the nasopharynx is seen, one may view the adenoidal pad if it still exists. If one specifically wants to view the nasopharynx, a flexible endoscope is preferable. In the pediatric age group, it's used to evaluate adenoidal size. In adults, in a patient who has a unilateral middle ear effusion, without an obvious cause, to rule out the possibility of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. For additional information regarding any of the illnesses we discuss, we invite you to visit the AAO HNS website, entnet.org.